This is Endangered Genomes, our uh, December spark. So this unit or this storyline framework is all about um, genetics and heredity through the lens of conservation and endangered species. So there are opportunities to tie in some ecosystem and human impacts standards like impacts of resource availability, um, bio biological changes in ecosystems, um, or like abiotic and biotic changes in ecosystems, and climate change based on the phenomenon that I chose. So the phenomenon is basically the um, the Australian wildfires and partly and how they impacted the koala population. So the koala population has already been has been decreasing for a while. However, in the last three years, it's decreased like thirty percent by twenty twenty one estimates. And um, the the wildfires that we had in twenty twenty were a big a big part of that. It destroyed a lot of their habitat. Um, in addition to actually you know um, killing a lot of animals. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, the the anchor phenomenon, and I'm going to show you like the raw version of this. But basically, it asks students to be. It, it puts students in this role of being um, asked to apply for a grant for a conservation program, and it asks them to focus on three specific areas. And there's a bunch of resources they can use to do this. But we need to make the point that there is a clear and pressing need. So why is it important to save this species now? And that's where you can get into climate change, um, resource availability, the impacts to the ecosystems, you know, why are koalas endangered? Um, and that actually aligns to the pathways. So you can see that the anger experience is going right into the pathways. So why are koalas endangered? Um, the unique value of this species. So why is this species of particular interest? Now, koalas are not, um, they're not like a keystone species in the same way that, you know, like elephants have this huge impact on the other ecosystem. However, they're they they're that and I can't think of the word right now, but it's like the the charismatic species. They're cute and cuddly and people are motivated to to save them. And when you save an organism like a koala by you know preserving its habitat, for example, um, we we, we save a lot of organisms. Um, however, in addition to that, so that's a lot of the still the ecosystem related type of standards um, and human impacts. In addition to that, we this part of the anchor experience is really targeted towards students um and understanding like the unique the uniqueness of the koala itself which ties into our second pathway which is like how do koalas survive on poison because they do they eat poisonous eucalyptus leaves as their primary source of of, of nutrition of food and of water actually so we're we're gonna present we're gonna like you know koalas are really unique and cool in this way so that's part of it um, and then the third uh, part of this is this evidence-based conservation plan. So like how do we use all of this understanding of their unique um, value, their heredity, their genetics, as well as the ecosystem impacts, climate change, all of that to like create a conservation plan. And basically this is geared toward getting toward these ideas of like genetic diversity and why that's really important in populations. And it's something that we consider when we are developing conservation plans. So the anger experience does not ask them to create like a plan or any, or really answer these questions. It's most, it's, it's about asking the questions, right? Gearing them toward that. And in subsequent activities, they learn different pieces and then you can come back to this. The assessment for this unit does not actually, it doesn't focus on koalas. It focuses on actually a different species, kind of in the same, endangered species in the same, in the same boat, declining populations, um, limited genetic diversity and, and things like that. But, um, but throughout the unit, you should definitely be coming back to that anchor experience and applying what students are learning toward, you know, answering that questions. And you might even incorporate like that conservation plan or that grant pro process, um, grant application, whatever, as a like um, a project you're working on as a class as you're moving through the unit, um, almost like a project based learning type of thing. But there's there is an additional assessment that can be given to individual students um, that, again, are based that are as addressed and targeted toward the standards. So there's three pathways that I kind of identified here. 
We have exploring biotic and abiotic, um, or I'm sorry, we have why are koalas endangered? And again, that's the ecosystem and human impacts focus. I didn't create a, a ton of new resources for this. Um, the anchor phenomenon presents a little bit about like the habitat loss in Australia and all of that. And if you decide to go this route, there are some bonus activities that are, you know, in, in our bonus library that address a lot of those um, ecosystem topics, like exploring biotic and abiotic factors, understanding the, those relationships, um, understanding the availability of water, looks at how changing water impacts plant populations, impacts um, animal populations, even in, I think it even has impacts in mosquitoes. Um, so you, you can see that, uh, or no, maybe it, one of the resource availability ones. I think it's the availability of water does. Um, and so you can see students can build this understanding that the the resources in an ecosystem impact populations. And then your job would be to direct that attention and application back to the koala. Okay, so we know the wildfires destroyed all of this habitat. We know that climate change is reducing precipitation. It's creating these droughts. Like how is that going to impact koala populations? And, and having those discussions with students. So that's where your um, that first pathway is. It's a lot of bonus resources. So your job would be to like take what students learn in those activities and then bring it back to the koala. Now the um, we really focused on and when we were creating this spark the second two pathways here. So this idea of how do koalas survive on poison and then how can genetics help save a species? And these standards are 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 the I'm um, sorry these pathways address the standards related to genetics and heredity. So. Um, depending on where you like want to start with your students, I would say this one, this middle pathway is probably the one that makes the most sense. But again, you want to do whatever you can to be responsive to your students. And there's not necessarily like a wrong way. The second pathway focuses more on like the genetics portion, um, DNA and mutations and how we go from DNA to traits and all of that stuff. Where the third pathway focuses more on um, sexual reproduction and passing on those traits. So there's not necessarily, like you could go back and forth. It doesn't necessarily, I, I think you could do it both ways. I'm going to present it the way I would see it flowing. Um, but again, you do you, you, you do what your, your students are, are most interested in, are ready for, um, are excited to learn about. So the first, the second pathway here, how do koalas survive on poison? So we're really gearing toward that again, and this is not what, you know, the anchor experience looks like. This is my rough draft version. But um, the unique value of this species. Why is this species of particular interest? So, I'm sorry if you can hear my kids screaming in the background. Um, it's Saturday. <laughs> So why are conservationists collecting DNA? This activity looks at, um, it actually introduces a little investigative level phenomenon, the African wild dog, and it looks at how scientists are using, it, it presents this idea that scientists are using DNA or collecting DNA in order to understand shifts in the population and understand like what's happening. So it really takes students from, it's this initial investigative phenomenon that we did not separate out, it's part of the activity. That's the um, phenomenon. And then it asks students to basically go from DNA to traits. So it's looking at this bigger picture, like how does DNA, how does its structure lead to these different traits, lead to these different alleles? So it does intro it introduces the structure of DNA. If there's a modeling activity where students are actually building a 3D model of DNA, whether you do that or not, um, it takes students to this understanding that DNA influences traits. Now, where do scientists find genetic material? It's kind of like an extension. A lot of times our students don't realize that DNA is found in all cells. They think it's just like, I don't know, in maybe certain cells or something. They just don't really get that you can you can find DNA in, in almost anything. However, there's all, they also don't always realize that there are different types of cells that look different. And, you know, some types of cells maybe are are good for DNA testing and some are, are not good. So it just kind of reinforces this, this idea that our DNA is found in cells and that there are these different types of cells. It could be, if you're short on time, I would say you could cut that activity for sure. However, if your students maybe are not fully understanding or even just need a review, like maybe you haven't done cells yet or they did cells in a previous um, year, it might be good to remind them of like where this DNA is actually found and this idea that our bodies have a lot of different types of cells. Um, so the next kind of one in this, in this sequence, and again, 
make whatever adaptations you need for your students. But this would kind of get into how do genetic differences explain observable traits? And now we're moving more into the mechanisms of um, tr DNA to trait. So in the first activity, we were just getting like the this structure of DNA codes for like these traits. And we did not get into this idea of proteins. Like this DNA actually codes for proteins or amino acids that create proteins that influence traits. So we're zooming in one level further and we're actually looking at those mutations and how they impact amino acids and how they impact traits and how traits can be um, like beneficial, these mutations can be beneficial, these mutations can be, um, can, it can be harmful or they can be neutral, you know, so it's that M, uh, MS, LS, MS LS3-1 mutation standard. Um, in the subsequent activity after that, we're coming back to our koalas and we're looking at how the koalas mutations influence their behavior. So there's that MS LS1-8 standard that looks at sensory input and how it like travels to the brain and influences behavior and memories and nobody ever knows what to do with it. And this was the perfect opportunity to address that standard. So I was actually really excited to be able to incorporate this. So how do koala senses influence their behavior? Koalas, um, they, they, <laughs> my kids, they, um, they sequenced the, ge the genome for koalas and they found that they have these extra genes for, um, they have these extra genes for like tasting bitterness, tasting water, smelling bitterness. So we have these mutations that that these unique, um, you know, genetics mutations of whatever genes that koalas have that literally have a direct influence on the leaves that they choose to eat in you know any given day. So it's a it's a an activity where students are reading. Um, two scientific articles as well as a like literally from a science journal articles um but adapted for student use to and um an additional resource and really truly addressing that mslis 1-8 so it's a really it was just a perfect opportunity to incorporate that um and then i included this bonus activity this was actually designed more at the high school level but it also is kind of a little bit outside the standards it's the story of how dna was discovered and so it's looking at the contributions of all of these different scientists um, across history and toward our understanding of genetics and our understanding of DNA. And um, it's a fully digital activity. It's a bonus activity in there for you in case you wanna like deep dive into like Rosalind Franklin's contribution and, and debates about should she have like more recognition. Um, it introduces Mendel, it introduces obviously Watson and Crick and, and, and the whole cast, um, Maurice Wilkins, and I think there might even be some earlier ones that we included. Um, so that's a, a kind of a bonus activity, an extension activity you might want to incorporate. Okay, so students now understand that DNA leads to traits. The kind of process that does that is like DNA to amino acids to proteins to traits. So now what do we do with that, right? Okay, so that's kind of like DNA at the individual level. Now we're going to be looking at DNA at the more like population level and the implications for endangered species and conservation. So we introduce a new phenomenon here, um, and it is the California condor and chondrodystrophy in that population. Um, and that's a genetic disorder that emerged during a captive be breeding program. Um, scientists, the California condor was down to like 20 individuals in 1985-87, something like that. They were all brought into the lab. They ended up breeding 14 of them and rest like restoring this California condor population um, from those four, 14 original breeding pairs or breeding individuals. Um, so what what happened is that this, this genetic disorder emerged and in the investigative phenomenon, students actually are analyzing a pedigree to um, to make observations, ask questions, draw conclusions, or preliminary conclusions about what's happening with this chondrodystrophy. Um, and then that lead, that flows into the next activity, which also pairs, it's it's still about the California condor. Why aren't all offspring the same? Students are, um, students are looking at karyotypes. And I think we actually introduced an, a, a monkey karyotype first. They see a human karyotype as well, but then they're actually like constructing, um, they're kind of like constructing the DNA of a California condor. So students end up with this understanding of sexual reproduction is to um, the genetic material from an egg and a sperm that are coming together, that they mix in the process that creates this genetic diversity. And, um, 
and then they can apply it back to why um, why do with the the hatching eggs and the chondrodystrophy why don't all of them have chondrodystrophy why do the parents not exhibit it but like one of the offspring did um in the in the one group or like four of the offspring did in the other breeding pair um and so they're able to get that understanding of sexual reproduction in that way uh and then the I would actually insert an activity here, and eventually we are going to. We don't have one right now for you, but I would probably, if you, if it fits into your curriculum, like insert something with Punnett squares at this point, and maybe making predictions about heredity. Um, but we in the science in the storyline text student text. Um, we did introduce Gregor Mendel and the like laws of inheritance and dominance and recessive and all of that, and that is addressed in. Um, a little bit in why are conservationists collecting DNA as well. It's introduced this um, this idea of dominant and recessive. So I would probably come back to those ideas of dominant and recessive and looking at how that can apply to the condor situation, looking at making predictions. Um, the the instances of chondro dystrophy, it's like a, you know, 20, 22% um, of the offspring exhibited this trait. So it's like almost perfect for, a rece- you know, a recessive um homozygous and heterozygous pairing. So uh, it, it really flows into that like Punnett square type of exploration. So that would be something that you might want to consider at that point. Um, and then finally, the unit assessment, it introduces a new um, investigative phenomenon, the Florida panther population. They were down to like eight individuals. Um, there was a lot of inbreeding happening, some genetic, you know, um, issues arising from that. And, uh, and what, what scientists did was introduce Texas pumas into the population for breeding to, inter- to bring more genetic diversity to that population. And it succeeded. So, um, so that, was, so that uh, is the phenomenon for the assessment. And it asked students, this assessment is really geared toward 3-1 and 3-2. So um, develop and use a model to describe why structural changes, so that whole mutations to proteins to traits, as well as the sexual reproduction elements of this genetic variation. Um, and and in even actually a little bit of like uh, inheritance of desired traits because um, like artificial selection, because scientists were the ones making this happen, right? So that it really addresses those standards. Um, and again, the LS1-8 is really addressed very well in how to call a census influence behavior. Um, so that's pretty much endangered genomes and how I would go about probably teaching this framework and this unit. I We had so much fun creating this unit. Um, it was really... I, I find genetic disorders really fascinating. I think I think a lot of kids find heredity and genetics fascinating. And I've always like typically taught it in like a you know human genetic disorders kind of perspective or like not really. I, I wasn't using phenomena when I was teaching it. Well, I wasn't using phenomena well when I was teaching this. But um, that's often that like what was referred back to. Um, and it was actually kind of really fun thinking about it differently and thinking about it from this endangered species perspective and putting it in that context of you know, genetics and heredity and understanding these things can help humans, but it can also help um, our animals too, right? Okay, so, um, and it might be a little bit more, I don't know, you don't run the risk of like having a student who has a genetic disorder in your class and then making it um, maybe sometimes uncomfortable for them or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, it was just a really fun unit. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, please reach out, and I hope this helps you um, figure out how to put this together for your students and how to guide your students through this. I'll talk to you later.